And uh, also, any information presented here will be a uh, day ahead on peak average unless otherwise indicated. All right, so pretty quick outlook for you. The agenda uh, review last winter, uh, in comparison to the previous winter, uh, somewhat of a, a non-event, just going to go over the demand, the gas, and of course the impact that had on prices. Uh, then we're going to jump into the demand outlook for the spring, and then we're going to go over some more things for the spring, uh, just some historical interface flows, transfer limitations, some upcoming outages, uh, nuke refuelings, and uh, another note about generation. All right, so quick review of the winter. <clears throat> Overall, we saw a very, very warm uh, December, uh, one to two degrees above average. Uh, as a result, we did see relatively bearish pricing. Uh, getting into January, we did actually hit our peak demand. However, it was pretty much in line, slightly below average, uh, and we did see that reflected in the pricing. Then getting forward into February, it was three to four degrees below average, very cold. Uh, we did finally see gas start to pop there towards the end of the month. Things did get constrained, and we'll go over that here in a second. So again, just looking at the gas, uh, this is a four-year comparison. These are also three-day averages for the gas. Uh, obviously, looking back last year was the most bullish gas we have seen. Uh, but here, the purple line represents the most recent winter, and we can see the effects of the very warm December and mild uh, January as well, especially in comparison to years past. And then once temperatures started dropping uh, for the below average February, we can clearly see the impact that that did have on the natural gas price. And uh, as expected, we do see a strong correlation between the gas and the, uh, the price of electricity in New York here, Zone A and Zone G, again, giving you a four-year, uh, three-day average comparison. <clears throat> and we see the most bullish pricing towards the end of February, where we saw the most bullish gas uh, as a result of, of very, very low temperatures. So again, just to summarize the winter, uh, somewhat of a non-event load ended up being neutral as the very uh, weak December was offset by the very strong February. From a generation standpoint, we saw a very, very healthy supply stack, uh, very few uh, outages at all during the winter. That was one of the reasons for the very bearish pricing that we did see uh, through December and January. Uh, Transmission-wise, it was overall neutral. Uh, we did have a some cross-sound uh, issues, so we did see some bullish zone K pricing. Gas was very, very bearish, uh, strong generation, um, strong imports, also very low oil, so gas prices never really shot up as much as we saw last year. Generation was clearly able to push the oil at much, much weaker pricing. Uh, and overall imports, uh, specifically from HQ, remained very robust, uh, very robust PJM flows as well. Uh, and again, Zone K did have some, some bullish uh, imports as the uh, cross on cable was down. <clears throat> so jumping forward into spring. Overall, uh, the forecast is for a below average uh, temperature for the spring uh, on the whole, and then a on average precipitation anomaly. Jumping into a month over month comparison. So for March, uh, kind of as we were already beginning to see uh, as this month does begin, we're going to be looking for uh, no average temperatures across the entire northeast here, uh, one to two degrees on average. And then in western New, New York, uh, Buffalo, Zone D, um, C, and uh, B, we're going to see two to three degrees below average. Uh, fairly cold conditions for this time of year. Uh, we should see that drive some price. April is expected to be in line with a, a typical April, nothing really to note there. And then we're actually going to have a much cooler May uh, than we usually see, again, about one to two degrees below average uh, for the northeast there and for eastern New York. An important thing that I do want to note here, in the case of March, when we have a below average March, that means that we're going to have more heating load. So that is bullish price, bullish demand. When we have a below average May, that is bearish cooling load. So in that case, we're going to be bearish loads, bearish prices. So uh, again, they, they, uh, they're opposites. A cold March is, is bullish, and a cold May is bearish. 
here we have the forecasted precipitation anomalies. Uh, it's going to be a uh, little wetter in March, uh, specifically in the uh, southern part of the United States, keeping a little ways up to New York, New York City, Massachusetts there, than the rest of the spring as a normal precipitation. Summary here of the demand. Uh, so again, we are expecting it to be cooler than average across New York. Uh, anomalies are not expected to be as strong as we did see in February. So good news. It does look like the worst is behind us. Um, <clears throat> and again, a, a cooler than average is bullish for the beginning and bearish for the end of the spring. Precipitation is expected to be uh, near normal. Only significant anomalies coming in the wet month of March. And uh, it is a El Nino week and will only affect the region by causing precipitation to be focused in the southern United States, April and May, again meaning it will be very dry through the end of the spring. Year-over-year -year interface flows to kind of give everybody a feel of what we can expect from the uh, import exports for New York. Uh, overall HQ Looking at 2014 as somewhat as an outlier, as that is brought down by a, uh, a very cold March we did have last year. We, we did see a pullback on some of those flows. So really going to be looking for pretty consistent flows around a gig on peak average uh, pretty much every day of the spring. IMO, we can see 2012 through 2014, very consistent flows. I do expect that to continue. We could actually see more IMO flows. I'll go over that in the next slide. For New England, uh, 2012 through 2014, we've seen a consistent uh, increase in the exports to New England. Definitely expect that to continue. Furthermore, they are without Vermont Yankee this year, so that will increase the amount of exports we will send to New England. Uh, very, <clears throat> very robust PJM flows, uh, about 500 megawatts on average. A lot of variability intra-month, uh, but in terms of the, the spring totals on average, I do expect that to stay consistent as well. Could see a slight increase if we do increase those flows out to New England, as we do see a, a pretty typical flow pattern from the west to the east. Month over month, uh, so this is looking at last spring, uh, the changes we saw through the month. Once again, uh, HQ fairly consistent. We'll go over HQ in a little more detail. Uh, and again, looking for some more this March, as it is going to be uh, relatively warmer in Montreal. They should be able to send a, a little bit more to us. IMO, we're going to be looking for a consistent increase throughout the month. Uh, again, though, uh, this is slightly skewed as there was some issues with the Don Natural Gas Hub uh, early March last year. As a result, uh, IMO was much more expensive than we're anticipating it to be this year. So I would expect much, much stronger flows in March and as a result, an increase in year-over-year -year flows coming in uh, from IMO. Uh, New England, pretty much what we would expect see, we do see exports to New England decrease pretty drastically as things start to warm up in the Northeast. Uh, despite the somewhat bearish or, or cold temperature outlook, uh, I do expect this pattern to continue just as we get further and further removed from, from winter and uh, congestion on that Algonquin system becomes less and less of an issue. I, I do expect a pullback in those exports to New England. And we see PJM uh, follow in an opposite direction as things start to warm up in the Northeast we receive less flows from PJM. Uh, once again, I do expect this pattern to continue. Getting into major D rates that we are looking at, uh, the um, Chateau Gras to Messina uh, is without a doubt the largest D rate that we will be looking at. It is uh, going to cut all flows coming down from HQ pretty much through the entire month of May. Uh, so we'll probably be looking at a slightly decreased HQ flows uh, year over year. Uh, what that's going to do is it's also going to derate the amount of central east congestion that we would typically see. So we're going to see much tighter AG spreads, uh, assuming there's no other congestion in the market than we typically would on a normal day. We're also going to be looking for higher heat rates. Uh, other important outages to note, uh, we are going to lose the, the 1385 cable and the Neptune cable uh, for about 10 days here in April and then um, <clears throat> about eight days there in May. So that is some upside zone K congestion. On top of that, we have an outage at Shore Road, the 6th through the 13th of May. So again, we're going to be looking for some strong upside zone K separation. Uh, another important outage I do want to note, the Back to Niagara 345 KB outage that goes out uh, April 9th through April 10th. 
Now that lists the D-rate on that IMO interface as 500, uh, putting a transfer capacity of 1,400. As we've seen uh, in the winter and uh, in years past as well, the actual D-rate that we're going to see is about 900, and that's just a discrepancy between IMO reporting and New York reporting. So in terms of zone A congestion, that is a downside zone A congestion risk on those days when we have those outages at back to Niagara. Uh, there is a longer term 230 outage. That does not have the same uh, transfer capacity uh, impact, but again, we will look for a slight pullback in IMO during those days. So not as strong a downside zone congestion risk, but certainly a factor. Outside of the transfer limitations I was just showing you, there are quite a few uh, Dysinger East D rates, uh, and definitely want to break these down. So Niagara to Rochester, we have already seen that did drive some zone A downside zone A congestion in the day ahead clear for tomorrow. That line will remain on average through the sixth, and we can see the uh, total transfer capacity is now 1,700 megawatts. Uh, we have a number of Rochester to Pinnell outages. We can see those are pretty consistent, one going out pretty much each week all the way through uh, the end of April. Then we're going to look for more Niagara Kintai outages coming up in March, uh, and then Kintai Rochester, and then another Niagara to Rochester. On the, uh, in the middle there, we can see the total transfer capacity when these lines are on outage. Uh, 1,700 for the, the worst of them, 1,300 actually for Niagara Rochester, then around 2,300. The graph on the bottom here shows the max Dysinger East clear, again, day ahead, uh, for every day last fall, uh, I'm sorry, last spring. Now again, these are not the on-peak average, the, these are the max. So we can see that almost every day there was at least one hour that would have scheduled some sort of violation uh, with the definitely the 1700 and for the first half of the spring for the 2300 megawatt year rates as well. So when I look at this, I see very, very strong possibility. We see a lot of downside zone A congestion. Uh, the Dysinger East certainly seems like a very strong possibility anytime one of these lines does go on outage. So just some other line outages um, that technically don't derate anything, but I, I would like to point out the most important of which is going to be Niagara Packers 115. We're going to lose that uh, for a very long term. It is a 45-day outage uh, from the uh, 316 to 430. So again, we will be looking for some upside zone A congestion risk, uh, depending on, on where those flows come in. And then real quick, just the NISO forecasted um, generation on outage. Uh, and we can see that just as we enter out of season, we're going to be looking for quite a bit of generators. Uh, it's really going to weaken the supply stack, and uh, we'll push prices up uh, relative to where load and gas are coming in. <clears throat> uh, getting into the uh, new refueling, Gideon Point 3, uh, they have already uh, exited the market. They went out uh, on the, the day ahead for the second. It should be out till about the 23rd. They are located in zone H. So I did put the closest load center as NYC. Not necessarily accurate, but they, they are um, <clears throat> they are downstate. So the, the load needed to be met in NYC will have the largest effect, effect on, on how this prices with this unit out of the market. Some important things to be looking for when this unit comes back. Genscape does not actively monitor this unit. So in order to get a better feeling of um, <clears throat> their output, you're going to want to look at the difference between the uh, Dunwoody South and the UPNY Con Ed interface. So we can see in the blue, oh, I'm sorry, in the green line there, it is the ratio of uh, flows over Dunwoody versus flows over UPNY Con Ed. And then in the blue line, we have the NRC report, and we can see when the NRC report falls to zero, meaning that that unit is no longer producing any power, we start to see an inverse re uh, relationship between Dunwoody South and UPNY Con Ed. And then as we see the unit bit back in, according to the NRC, we can see the ratio of flows return to uh, positive and really break about 500. It is where you can be confident that that unit is definitely starting to get back into the day ahead. So we're going to be uh, monitoring the flows over this interface very carefully, and it's going to give us a very good indication of uh, if this unit returns early and really what their overall output is. We did go ahead and we looked at the historical bids for these units when they are returning from outages. Uh, so they go out about every uh, every two years or so. So this is 2011, 2013 that we looked at. And they do a incremental bid strategy. So 
First, we will see them return in the NRC report at a uh, smaller percentage, something less than 100. Uh, and once they get up <coughs> past about 50, they're going to begin to bid the unit into the day ahead, and they're going to bid it in incrementally over three days. So they're going to reach 100 in the NRC report before they reach 100 in the in the day ahead. But on the third day of bidding into the day ahead, we do expect them to finally reach uh, 100. <coughs> Nine Mile One uh, is expected to go on outage. A smaller unit, only 650 megawatts, located zone C. Uh, that will be between West Central and Central East interfaces. Uh, however, we do monitor that unit as a part of the um, <coughs> Independence Fitzpatrick Nine Mile Complex. So we can directly see when that unit starts getting back into the day. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, comes back into real time. Uh, 322 through 420 will be its expected outage time. Uh, this one also has a very consistent strategy when bidding back into the day ahead. Uh, again, we got this information from their own bids the last two times they were on outage, uh, so it is accurate. So they will run in the real time only until they reach 100% in the NRC report, and then they will wait one day at running 100%. They will bid in 75% upon their first return, and then on the second day of bidding into the day ahead, they will increase it to 100. Main takeaways here, not only does it help us uh, better forecast the day ahead using the NRC report, but it also gives us great insight into uh, real-time risk as these very, very large baseload generators will begin running in the real-time before they bid into the day ahead. So I will most likely be looking for some bearish real-time pricing when I expect these units to come back in. Expected to begin running uh, by the end of 2014. Uh, we do monitor this unit, and we did not see any output from it. I'm not sure of its status. Um, I think it is facing some environmental issues. Uh, however, not sure how that will affect its ability to return. But it is something we will be looking for and watching very, very uh, closely. When it does come back, we should see some downside to Zone G. Uh, we're going to see reduced central east and Pleasant Valley leads congestion. Uh, when it finally does get back in there. It's going to have about four units of about 530 megawatts of generation capable of switching between gas to oil or even coal. So to summarize uh, the spring of 2015, overall load in Zone A is bullish as a very cold um, March that we are expecting for the western uh, part of New York will drive a uh, strong uh, load and, and stronger prices out there in Zone A. For G, J, and K, we felt that the overall output would be uh, a bearish one as the very weak load and uh, weak temperatures we're expecting for May will likely drive down those, that load. Uh, Generation-wise, we are expecting it to be bullish just as the pretty much guaranteed loss of those two nuclear units. Uh, again, though, questionable return advanced gamer um, may, may make it a slightly more bearish factor, but until we know more, we will expect those, those needs to be the, the primary driver. Transmission in Zone A. Uh, all I can say about Zone A is I do expect there to be congestion. I do expect it to be very volatile. We have a number of Dissinger East outages, which, which I went over, which I certainly will expect to send some downside. However, we also have a very long-term uh, Niagara Packard outage, which I certainly expect to drive some upside congestion. Furthermore, uh, when we lose those HQ flows, that's going to price up Zone A quite a bit, as there will be no Central East in the market. Uh, or unlikely it will be central east to, to bid it back down. So overall, it is a mixed bag for Zone A. Expect quite a bit of uh, volatility uh, over the shoulder. Uh, Transmission perspective, G through K, the, um, <clears throat> the largest outage we're going to have is going to be that HQ1. Uh, and also you can see for imports overall outlook, despite the expected increase uh, in HQ throughout, the, throughout uh, this month, March, and Despite the increase in expected uh, output from IMO, the loss of HQ for pretty much all of May will be the overall largest uh, factor that will be bullish. And again, Zone K, there are some other outages, 1385 and the Neptune cable. Gas is expected to remain bearish uh, as, as prices stay low, as inventory stay high, and as output stays high. We are going to be looking for very, very bearish gas. Also, uh, especially when we get to May, the, the low heating load that we're going to see due to the impact of some cold temperatures will again lend some downside to gas. So with overall bearish load and overall bearish gas, I do expect very weak pricing during this uh, shoulder period. Uh, however, there, there definitely is some upside risk, um, some congestion risk, and we could see some pretty interesting zonal separation 
as there's going to be a lot of volatility out there in Zone A. So that is the end of the webinar. Um, I will hang around for uh, about a minute here, uh, look to see if there are any questions, or give you guys a chance to, uh, to, to type in some questions, and I'll be back in a minute. Thanks. All right, uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, again, we will be sending out the recording and the slides. If anybody has any questions uh, about my outlook or if anybody would like a more detailed uh, summary of the winter or, or anything that you were hoping to hear that, that you think I missed, I really encourage you to reach out to me. I have my uh, direct office line and my email here. And uh, of course, you can always send an IM to Genscape NISO. Thanks. Bye.